Nate Silver on how Friday's jobs numbers may or may not change the outlook for November. Polls are reliable, but they're just a snapshot in time. They're based on their impressions at the moment. Also today, polling in the swing states, a conversation with Twitter's man in D.C. Governor Romney, are you concerned about some of the mishaps on your trip? And op-ed columnist Frank Bruni on Romney and the press. The suspicion develops in the press corps about why are you hiding from us? Why do you trust yourself so little? I'm Megan Lieberman, live from the New York Times newsroom. The jobs numbers for July will be out tomorrow morning, and Nate Silver of the 538 blog joins me now with a preview. So, Nate, what is the expectation for the jobs numbers tomorrow? So, people are not expecting a game changer. By definition, you expect kind of more of the same most of the time. This is one of those cases for about 100,000 jobs to be created last month, which would be a little bit better than in the prior two months, but still characteristic of a very sluggish recovery. And does that change your view of the presidential race, for instance, at all? Well, I, I think it's consistent with the other data we're seeing, if we do get that number, where you, when you have about 2% growth, which is below average but not recessionary, you'd expect about 100,000 jobs to be created. So <clears throat> if it's at 100,000 or within a pretty reasonable range of it, there's a lot of error in this number and uncertainty. Um, I think it's not going to be a, a major difference maker. Obviously, the economy is already a negative for Obama, probably on balance, but it's probably priced into his stock right now. So how far a deviation would you need from 100,000 for it to be sort of a game changer in terms on, of the election? On the downside, if we certainly if we get a negative number, that's going to be a terrible that's headline good, yeah. for the president, um, or a number that's like 30 or 40,000. Um, on the upside, if, if we're in the high 100s, 170, 180, that's a genuinely encouraging number, not just relative to expectations, but in line with, with actually reducing the unemployment rate. And so, you know, anything in the, in the low ones or even the high five digits, I think, is it'll make a headline. I don't mind when people cover the jobs report, but, but not really telling us anything that we didn't already know, I don't think. We had about a six-week run of what looked like pretty terrible economic data there. Yeah. Is that something that you would have expected to be sort of reflected in polls by now in terms of potentially pushing people to Mitt Romney? Yeah, if, if you're Romney's campaign, this is one thing that should, <clears throat> should frustrate you, where we've had for the last two or three months very bad jobs numbers, and, and you have, you know, appropriately bad coverage of the economy for, for a week or a weekend, then it, it kind of drifts off, or at least doesn't seem to affect the polls very much. So that's why I say if, we're, if we get 80,000 instead of 100,000, then I'm not sure it's going to really affect things that much. But if you have a number where it's like zero, right, um, then that could make quite a lot of quite a lot of difference. But so far, Obama's been, been pretty resilient. It could be a case of kind of two wrongs making a right, where, say, Romney's personal favorables are taking a hit, and people are getting more bullet, or bearish, rather, about the about the economy, um, but you know nothing seems to move these numbers, which is why I think you need a big surprise to, to make it a, a huge three-alarm fire kind of story. Now, you also see some comparative bright spots in the economy. What are those? Yeah, so we got a new report on personal income growth, which is a measure that has correlated well with elections in the past, and that's been growing at a rate of about 4% so far this year, which is encouraging. Um, we should say those numbers are are very, very noisy. They were just revised a lot. It's hard to add up all these different ways that people make make income. But um, but we're by no means in a case like 2008 or 1980 where everything was was falling apart. It's about three doses of bad news, but then you get two doses of good news in between. And in those cases, an incumbent president, if he doesn't have too many other problems, might get just enough of the benefit of the doubt from voters to win, to win narrowly. So if the economy sort of continues to kind of bump along, as is between now and November. What does that mean for the forecast model? So right now we're projecting like almost literally to the point a 2004 type victory for Obama where I think we have it 50.7 percent to 48.3 which is exactly what Bush beat beat Kerry by um, and you'd have you know we have Obama narrowly ahead now in Ohio and Florida as Bush narrowly won those states. So that's an example of an incumbent who had quite a few problems um, but just kind of coasted by. If you had the election Today, we think that's about what would happen, and certainly, um, if, if by definition, if things stay about the same, then we think Obama would be favored for, for a narrow win under those cases. Before we go, we should say where the model is now. You, uh, as of yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, gave the president the largest advantage in the Electoral College you've yeah. given him so far. Why? Um, well, we had a set of very good polls for the president in Ohio, uh, Pennsylvania, and Florida, as well as a separate poll in, in Michigan by a different company. Um, if you're Mitt Romney, you don't want to be behind now in, 
in the Ohio polls and the Florida polls. We can debate whether Obama's slightly ahead or ahead by a larger margin, but a Republican should have a pretty easy time winning Florida if he's going to win the Electoral College and should at least be tied by this point in Ohio. So that's why Romney does, I think, need, need something to change. He needs uh, maybe really bad economic news, not that he's rooting for it necessarily, but if you're rooting for his election, you probably want a, a bad jobs number tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, Nate. Thanks, Megan. This week, the Times introduced a new project, pairing up with Quinnipiac University to poll individual swing states. Earlier, Assistant Managing Editor Rick Burke sat down with national political correspondent Jeff Zeleny to talk about it. Jeff, our readers saw something new and different this week. We've had a partnership with CBS News since 1975, and suddenly they saw we had a CBS News and Quinnipiac University poll. My question for you is to put you on the spot. Do you even know where Quinnipiac is? Uh, Quinnipiac University is uh, in New York State somewhere, but uh, wrong. I do not know where wrong. it is. Wrong. It, oh, no. it is in Camden, Connecticut. Camden, Connecticut. Who knew? I didn't even know. I had to look that up, to, to be perfectly honest. Okay. We teamed up with them and CBS because they're very good at focusing in on states where the real battle is this year. And can you tell us a little more about sort of the advantage of this team collaboration? The value of this poll, it's uh, taking a snapshot, a measure of voter sentiment in key battleground states. It's where the advertising is, it's where the candidates are going. So the one uh, this week that uh, we did, our debut inaugural poll, was surveys of uh, Florida, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. And we'll have three more states coming up uh, in the coming weeks. It'll be Colorado, Wisconsin, and Virginia. So those are six of the battleground states. And it really gives us a window into why the campaigns are doing what they're doing and where things stand right now about 95 uh, days out until the election. Right. Now, we've had a tradition at the Times, as you know, of not overdoing the horse race. And a lot of other polling organizations and news organizations will lead their broadcasts or their stories with who's up or who's down. And we kind of try to play it down, but on the other hand, a poll is a poll. So can you tell um, our viewers a little about how you calibrate that when you write these polling stories of not looking like we're too horse racy, but not neglecting the fact that an, a campaign, an election is well a horse race? Well, we're not betting on the ponies here. We're betting on <laughs> presidential candidates. But I mean, what the most valuable part of the polls, I think, are, are the dynamics of why and, uh, and what the trends are. How empathetic is President Obama? Um, what do people think about Mitt Romney's business experience? But people want to get to the bottom line. So the bottom line in, in these numbers is always a bit outdated because it's a snapshot of time when you were taking the poll. In Pennsylvania, it showed that President Obama was up by 11 points. In Ohio and Florida, up by six points in each state. But that's only as, as good as sort of for the moment. That has a shelf life. But the bigger dynamics are the approval ratings and other things, which don't uh, change as much. So it's a mix. We, of course, present the horse race because that is, after all, election day is a horse race. Right. People have to vote someone right. up or down. But we focus more on the dynamics behind that number. Cell phones. How has that affected, the use of cell phones affected how we're polling? Some polls only call people on landline phones. That means the age of the respondents to your uh, poll really skews significantly higher. We, of course, have a mix of landline and cell phones. Some other polls out there are automated only, so an answering machine could pick it up and just touch one if you like this or touch two if you like this. We have real live people talking to real live people. In the poll stories, we quote real voters that were polled. Can you talk about that and, and how we pick those quotes? That's interesting. When you do those callback interviews, you kind of get the sense that polls are reliable, but they're just a snapshot in time. They're based on their impressions at the moment. Sometimes if you talk to someone a little bit longer, they can say, well, I'm sort of a little bit uh, up in the air on this. So you know, the answer is always the same, but they, as they talk through things more, you can show that these are real people and people can change their mind. And the nuances. And the nuances. And so, so that's why a poll is just a snapshot. Jeff, we'll let you back on the campaign trail. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. The people at Twitter think that polls are not the only way of taking the nation's pulse. Their new political index, or Twindex, analyzes, how tw analyzes tweets to show how people feel about the candidates. Adam Sharp, Twitter's man in D.C., joins me now from our Washington bureau. So Adam, Hi, tell, tell me how this index works and tell me what it's trying to capture. Well, actually, it's trying to capture the gaps in what you were talking about in the last segment, that traditional polling is very good at getting the state of the horse race but has never really been able to measure those natural conversations people are having with their friends and 
people with like interests in coffee shops, around water coolers, and at dinner tables across the country. And so with more tweets every two days today than had ever been sent before the last election, we wanted to reach out and try to measure those natural, unprompted responses to the campaign. So how does the system distinguish between what are actually positive tweets about the candidates and what are sort of snarky, ironic ones? How does it, how does it <laughs> judge that? Well, when you look at the Twitter political index, one thing to note, first of all, is that this isn't a typical horse race number where one candidate has to go up for the other to go down. Each candidate is rated against a scale from 0 to 100 relative to all other topics on the Internet that day. So roughly, if they're below 50, that would mean that people are talking more negatively about the candidates than they are about perhaps some other subjects. If it's above 50, it means they're talking about the candidates more positively. And our partners at the social analytics firm Topsy developed an algorithm to study not just words, but particular patterns of words and the context of words and abbreviations, picking up on regional colloquialisms to try to identify uh, whether they're positive or negative. Now, you talked about things like sarcasm. That is that gray area in the middle. And there's a lot of sarcasm. There's a lot of sarcasm on Twitter. <laughs> exactly, on both sides. So right, right off the bat, it's, it evens out a little bit. But it also creates that gray area in the middle as to what's positive or what's negative. And this is an area where by learning more and more, these algorithms get better. Right now, Topsy has found that if you were to take any tweet that they have categorized as positive or negative and show that to a random human score, the person would agree with the, excuse me, agree with the analysis more than 90% of the time. And that number continues to increase because we learn from those examples and make the algorithm stronger as time goes on. Right. The president spiked 10 points yesterday on the first day. What was that about? Well, to, one note to, to remember here is that this is based on natural conversation. It isn't a who are you voting for. It's what are people talking about and the tone of what they're talking about. Now, yesterday, President Obama exchanged tweets with Michael Phelps and the US women's gold, gold medal winning uh, gymnastics Olympics team. And that generated a lot of conversation on, on Twitter. So when the conversation was dominated by people talking about the president in the context of gold medal winning athletes, it wound up having a significantly higher overall sentiment than conversation related to, let's say, the economy or, or other issues the day before. So is this something that the campaigns could game? Could they game the system to try and sway the, the index toward their side? It's hard to game it sort of as, as one person trying to flood the, uh, flood the ballot box, if, if you will, mainly because of the sheer volume of tweets we're, we're looking at. What a candidate could do is effectively motivate their base, their supporters, to come out and tweet more actively and effectively. And if the can other candidate didn't respond, you could see a shift. We actually saw a shift like this from about August of last year to March and April of this year. In August, the president and his campaign seriously invested in, in Twitter during the debt ceiling debate and started activating their supporters when there was not yet a Republican nominee. Once the Republican field firmed up and got in line behind Mitt Romney as the presumptive nominee this spring, now there was a little bit more balance to the field and the number corrected back down. Adam, um, aren't we getting just a particular portion of the population here? Isn't there a demographic that's more likely to be on Twitter? There is likely a difference in demographics between the Twitter audience and the national population. We actually don't ask people demographic questions when they sign up for Twitter, so it's hard to measure that. But going back to the previous conversation, there are two challenges in every poll. One is trying to calculate who is a likely voter, and the other is how you account for the increasing number of Americans who are using mobile phones as a primary device. We are not looking at every Twitter user here. We're looking at those who are actively tweeting about politics. And we think that audience is much more similar to the national likely voter audience than, let's say, the overall Twitter population. Also, more than 50% of active Twitter users use Twitter on a mobile device. So if anything, we are showing greater strength than perhaps traditional models have there. But this is not designed to replace a poll the same way as satellites didn't replace the thermometer for weather forecasting, but gave forecasters a more complete picture of the weather. We think this helps fill some of those natural gaps in conversation that the polls can't pick up on. And we're very encouraged to see that the long range trends in our data actually track pretty closely with more traditional polling. One last thing. Um, one of my favorite things in the presidential campaign is to sort of watch the two sides going back and forth on Twitter. Do you have a favorite pair of sparring partners from the campaigns? 
I think it's been a lot of fun to watch David Axelrod on the Obama campaign and Eric Fernstrom on the, on the Romney campaign uh, go back and forth. You normally don't see uh, these behind the scenes players pop up anywhere except for the occasional Sunday morning show. And to see them interact with each other directly without a TV anchor playing referee uh, and bring a bit of that sport to the masses with tongue firmly in cheek on a lot of the tweets has been uh, fun to watch. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Megan. On his recent overseas trip, Mitt Romney barely engaged with reporters. Earlier, op-ed columnists Charles Blow and Frank Bruni sat down to talk about the candidate's relationship with the press. Let's just say the, the traveling press corps is not happy right now. They, they are not took, happy at all. He took no. three questions from them. Is that a workable strategy to try to keep his distance from the press corps? I think it may be more workable than ever, but it's still very dangerous. I say it may be more workable than ever because I think right now we're in a moment of, of a lot of public distrust for the media. We talked about this a little bit, right. you and I. I think the Romney strategy of not you know, feeding the media exactly what it wants was born in that climate, or is born in that climate. It's born of the belief that the press whining about access is not going to have a lot of traction with most voters. But what's the danger? You said there was well, the a danger. Well, da the, the danger is if a real antipathy and resentment develops toward the candidate, there's no good can come of it. And you think that, is, it, are they close to that happening? Is, is are I they think really? Edging, I think they're edging closer all the time. Governor Romney, are you concerned about some of the mishaps on your trip? What does that look like? For Romney, I mean, th does that mean that he gets grilled more? I mean, what does it look like on the ground, in print, in on television? Well, well, one of the things it means it means that everybody talking about him from that press corps that follows him, everybody writing about him, is doing it with a bit of resentment in their being. They okay. may not want to feel that. They may be trying to edit that out, but it does develop because people are human. Right. Um, and it, it means also, I think even more importantly, that a suspicion develops in the press corps about why are you hiding from us? Why do you trust yourself so little? We're seeing right now, for example, a whole lot of stories about how Mitt Romney is trying to win the presidency with no personality whatsoever. How he's betting that how likable he is will not matter because people just want this steward of the economy. That narrative about trying to win despite being unlikable, I think that narrative is born in a press corps that doesn't like you very much. Right. I covered Bush in 2000, and there were a lot of jaunts to the back of the plane by the candidate. Bush really prided himself, whether others saw him this way or not, as being personable. John McCain from right. 2008, uh, he didn't do it as much in 2008, but he was famous for loving to interact right. with reporters on his bus. I think Romney's persona is so much about, at least this is what he's putting out, right. You know, I, I'm, I'm the economic steward, I'm the management type, that he doesn't have to assert that personable side, and so he's holding back from the media in a way that is just so strikingly different. But do you believe that Romney and his handlers really are afraid that, you know, coming out of 2008, when there were gas that, you know, kind of did a lot of damage to McCain and his uh, campaign, could those be weighing on him and him just being out of an abundance of caution just saying, I don't want to take any chances? This campaign, more than any other that I've ever seen, has been gaff driven in terms of what the media focuses on. We are taking words, be they corporations or people, be they you didn't build that, and giving those words a half-life like they've never had before. If you've been successful, you didn't get there on your own. Just if you've got a business, that you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. My father's hands didn't build this company. My hands didn't build this company. I was just rereading a couple of sections of the book, The Real Romney, and I was reading in particular about his 1994 campaign against Ted Kennedy. And he was something of an awkward gaffe machine out in public. <laughs> There's this hilarious moment, for example, where a woman seems not to want to say hello to him, and he says, oh, it's because you're not wearing your makeup. And she says, no, I'm wearing my makeup. Hi, how are you? Don't, don't run away. I'll shake your hand anyway. <laughs> uh, you haven't, I know, you haven't got your makeup on yet, right? <laughs> you do, you do. <laughs> Good to see you. Appreciate Good your luck. help. Thank Good you. Luck. This seems to be a, a, a part of Mitt Romney, this awkwardness with the spontaneous stuff in public that is not getting better, that is not something he can learn. Let, let's wrap up. We're less than 100 days out. Can he run out the clock with this strategy? He can try to run out the clock. Um, they can try to keep on using external events like the vice presidential selection, the conventions to, to dominate the foreground. But the media is going to find a way to get its questions to him or to find unscripted right. moments. They just will. Right. And if those unscripted moments are fewer and farther in between, then the ones that don't, don't come off well are going to have a volume that the Romney campaign won't like.
And there you have it, Frank Bruni. Thank you for being here. See you next week. Before we go, check out these pictures. After the president of the fast food chain Chick-fil-A drew, drew criticism for his opposition to same-sex marriage, conservatives flocked to the chain yesterday for a hastily called Appreciation Day. As you can see, the lines were out the door in many places. On Friday, activists on the other side are planning a national same-sex kiss day at various outlets. Either way, the store's owners can't be too sad. After all, each side of the culture war still needs to eat. That's all for today. Stay with us online for more on Campaign 2012. I'm Megan Lieberman. Thanks for watching. Thank you.